around the same incident when we were not able to give the salary on time it was delayed by a couple of weeks what we thought as a gesture of doing was you know pay them x percent more for that month right i don't remember the exact percentage i think it was 5 or 10% more now this another guy not the person that shashank is talking about another guy who is also with us he took offense to that that we were paying 10% more he's like are you guys i know you by the three of you being founders are you taking more we said no uh, in fact we are taking less so he was like okay then i don't want 10% more i want the same thing that you guys do right hey shubh hey shashank thank you for agreeing to do this really looking forward to the chat sure thank you for having us here <clears throat> thank you looking forward to it awesome um so what is one truth few people agree with you on shubh shashank individually uh this is our ice breaker question uh, and it gives get some interesting answers in the context of freedoms and in the context of my life in general we believe in empowering people uh, i will right we have always done that uh, and there are many other examples we will share through the rest of the conversation today but uh, we've I believed in you know bringing the right folks into the company and empowering them with uh, the right toolkit so that they become successful what about you shashank yeah sure so i see one thing that uh, you know i when i talk to people right see building a company starting up is a cool thing and it has been a cool thing for quite some time now specifically for past 5 6 years everybody wants to do it yeah and uh, and see one thing that people usually don't agree with me on is that this is not this is not just about money Hmm. if money is your single most important motivation then you will give up even before you start because this journey is insanely hard and and starting up is actually a very irrational decision if you look at it you know uh, money talks a lot about rationality i put in this much effort i get this much money that doesn't take you too far you know uh, and what what i tell people quite a lot that it's not just about money it's also about the element of fun in building a company and also the element of meaning right and this and and that's where the fun money meaning is what the three things that drives our founders meaning is something that's most elusive right mm. like very few people get it right but right. what they also don't understand is the meaning is that is, is that one thing that actually helps you last longer than anybody else you know mm-hmm. uh, that is what actually sustains you through all the grill and the insane amount of work that you need to do which actually becomes in, inhuman sometimes you know uh, money cannot motivate you through the inhuman patches of your startup journey the meaning is the only thing that can that can hold uh, stead with you right that is something that most people don't understand and don't agree no that's I awesome i i actually completely agree with you that's something uh, when i look for in founders if they if they have something beyond money uh, for me it's like the problem that they are solving they're really passionate about it and that like i think eventually translates into meaning so yeah. that keeps them going in the hard times which as a founder I, i think there are a lot more hard times than than easy times yeah um and you know just uh, talking a bit about your uh, journeys um what was your journey before starting the company um did you always want to build something in this space if you could talk through that you also have uh, you know um an engineering and mba background from top tier institutes um does that cross disciplinary uh, experience help um when you're starting a company specifically in this space so if you can talk through your early journeys uh, before trends um shashank you want me to go first okay so uh my journey um in addition to the standard you know business school and and engineering which uh, seems to be a template uh, more often than not i uh, i've been a consultant all my life uh, you know started my career actually let me take a step back uh, my first job after itbhu was um, i i i was keen to stay true to my core in engineering which was chemical engineering so my first job was actually in manufacturing 
mm. uh, making biscuits for Britannia nice. in in a factory in Mumbai, uh, which was fun because I was uh, the twenty one year old kid trying to tell you know a bunch of uh, you know fifty plus workers how to do their jobs, which they have been doing for the last thirty years of their lives, right? Mm. Um, um, so, pun intended, uh, you know, they didn't really care about what I was telling them. <laughs> they had already been told by their unions uh, what they were supposed to do in the in in the in the shift. And uh, but the beautiful thing is, in the process of those, if I may say, uh, conversations where work was irrelevant they were doing what they were doing i was just hanging around because i had somebody had to be the shift manager i built some beautiful relationships and i learned how to sort of develop respect for in a in a professional organization for your team um and uh, you know understand how a traditional organization operates, right? Um, before I moved into Infosys, uh, which was a very different setting, a setting a tech job. Uh, but those two years in Britannia actually have been a very foundational experience, very, very foundational experience for me. Uh, so moving on to Infosys, uh, that was my tech career. Uh, that was a start of my tech career. I was, you know, running delivery, some of their large accounts. I moved to U.S. through Infosys. On they sponsored my, you know, U.S. visa, uh, and then after I came to the U.S., which was way back in uh, 2001, um, you know, a few years into that, I felt that I needed to develop a more holistic uh, commercial more holistic commercial skills because being a tech guy, you're kind of constrained to thinking like a tech guy. Uh, and, and it was important for me to understand broadly why are customers making decisions around, you know, uh, whether to invest into a hundred million dollar program or not, right? How do they think about finance and go to market and customers and so on. So got into a business school program, uh, in Kellogg, um, you know, I was in the full-time program there. So two years of that. Uh, post that, I chose consulting again because I liked the problem-solving aspect of consulting. I still very much do. And uh, I chose a smaller company uh, uh, called Diamond Consultants because I, I liked uh, the idea of having an impact in a smaller setting. Uh, so Diamond back then was a 500 people company, which is actually uh, significantly smaller than our current size today. Um, and then after Diamond, uh, this is around 2008, 2009, uh, this idea of becoming a founder myself, entrepreneur and starting a company uh, became very, you know, that, that idea kind of started to fester in a very meaningful way in my in my in, in, in my uh, thinkings and um, uh, I did not have any sales or business development experience so did a couple of gigs as sales leaders uh, one of them was with a company called Mu Sigma which is an analytics company and uh, in Mu Sigma uh, which is a fantastic company by the way uh, I saw uh, I, I got exposed to an industry the analytics industry which was still relatively nascent back then. And uh, I felt that if I ever were to, uh, you know, meet that aspiration of becoming a founder myself, it's, 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 um, you know, the, the, there was plenty of white space out there. Uh, and um, I had a different approach to kind of getting into that industry you know, and, and solve those problems. So in 2013, uh, eventually along after I left Mu Sigma, uh, you know, along with Sumit and Shashank, uh, I got started on uh, this uh, treatments journey. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But that's a bit about my uh, my background pre treatments I started uh, in 2003 uh, after graduating from IIT Madras. And I joined uh, a, a Defense Research and Development Organization. I was in DRDO. I was working there as a scientist. In fact, uh, 
In fact, I was posted in Pune, where Avril is right now. Uh, and I was, uh, I was in Khadagwasla, that is where you have uh, the National Defense Academy. And on, on the other side, there was this place back then, it was called Institute of Armament Technology. These days, it is called Defense Institute of Advanced Technology. Uh, that's where I was posted. I was there for like four years. Uh, and, uh, and I had some very crazy experiences over there. Like I still remember I was asked to teach a batch of, uh, majors and Latin colonels on how AK-47 works. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that really happened actually, you know, uh, but then of course, uh, you know, being a mechanical engineer, you figure out a couple of things and then you start teaching. Uh, so that happened, they put me as an officer in charge of a 300 people batch of scientists who were coming in from all India test and all that, uh, right? Uh, so that happened. And I think the interesting thing there was in those four years, I kind of figured that, you know, I will not excel as a scientist. So that became very clear uh, to me and people around me agreed to that actually. So, so I quit. <laughs> I gave GMAT, I went to uh, this very nice school called Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. So from Pune, I moved to Hyderabad. This was in 2007. This was a one-year course, had a fantastic experience. We had professors from Water and Kellogg who came in, flew in and taught us in the classroom. Uh, in 2008 uh, is when, uh, if you remember, the, the, the new startup ecosystem in, in India was booming with the likes of Flipkart and Mobi and all of those things happening. Um, and I thought, that, you know, let's join a startup. So I joined this company called Mu Sigma, you know, in 2008, that's a common connection by the way. Uh, and when I joined them, they were about a hundred people company. Uh, and I stayed with them for five years. Uh, so I am a, I am an accidental entrepreneur. Uh, I never knew that it is even possible to start a company, particularly by somebody like me. Uh, but those five years in Mu Sigma, as we grew from hundred people to like 2000 people, you know, I learned two things. I learned my trade which is data science and analytics. But more importantly, I learned how to build things from scratch. Because see, when you join a hundred people company, you do not join with a job description in mind, right? You do anything and everything that comes your way. And thankfully I did all those things. So I got that, that very first hand experience of how, how to build things. Um, and they sent me to Bay area, uh, in 2012. So I was living in San Jose in 2012, 2013. And that is a time that I started having a different vision of where this industry is going. Had a couple of uh, conversations with, with the founder, you know, did, we did not really align. So I quit uh, and I was on this thing called L1A visa. Uh, so I had to just go back to India. Um, and for me, I wasn't very clear even at that point of time what I was going to do next, but I was clear on what I'm not going to do, which is to continue with that company because the vision alignment was no longer there. Uh, so just with that conviction of, of knowing what you don't want to do, uh, you know, I quit uh, and I was uh, going back to Bangalore uh, and uh, while I was packing my bags is when I stumbled into Shubh and Sumit. Uh, in fact, I was in a coffee shop uh, in, in San Jose uh, thinking what to do with my life. And I, and back then we used to have this personal Skype, you know, uh, so I used the personal Skype. Uh, somebody told me that Shubh is also in Bay Area, so I pinged him. Shubh incidentally was on a flight at that time and incidentally he had an internet connection that was on, which is very unusual 10 years back. Yeah. Uh, but then he came back immediately and that just started a sequence of events, um, you know, ending in where we are right now. Uh, so it has been very incidental that way, went back to India, started uh, the, the Credence India. Uh, and that's how the first four, five employees started from my apartment. And then from there, we grew on to a rented apartment, a lot of interesting stories there. Uh, and then basically, yeah, for the first five, six years, set up the office, moved to Chicago, did head of sales uh, role, loved sales. Um, and then for the last two, two and a half years, I've been playing the role of chief revenue officer. And as I said earlier, see, I am an accidental entrepreneur. I never thought that, uh, you know, a person like me can even start a company. But see, the beauty here is that once you see a dream, and once you see a future possibility, right, then it becomes your responsibility to make it real. Like who else will do it for you, right? And that became the driving force. And I think with all acknowledgement, as Shubh also said that, and I want to reiterate that, if we had not worked in that data science company, which we did, uh, you know, I don't think we would have even thought that this thing was possible, you know? So a lot of credit goes to them. 
Uh, but yeah, that has been the journey so far. And you know what? One trivia for me, Credence is the biggest company I've worked for in my life, and it's probably going to be like that. So yeah, that's amazing. No, thanks for sharing that. Would like to maybe uh, talk a bit about that that moment when when you know you guys met. Uh, you were in San Jose. You kind of did you have an idea? Where were you at? What what convinced you to kind of do this startup? What was the initial problem that you were you were tackling? Well, the best person who can answer that is Shu. He brought all of us together. Uh, thank you, thanks, Shushank. And I think uh, what what uh, Shushank was saying earlier, I was just the the sort of uh, the serendipity of him pinging me and the three of us getting together. Um, you know, there are so many such instances, guys. Right over the last ten years, where we got that large deal or we were able to have this you know leader join us who who changed the trajectory for us it happened it feels that it happened by chance right it happens because we got lucky uh, but i think uh, i don't know who said this um, somebody said this um, you know luck luck uh, you know favors the prepared mind right uh, I, I think when you when you place enough bets uh, then uh, those good things happen to people who put in that effort, right? Um, I'll t- I'll tell you one more one more anecdote, guys, and then we will get to that uh, vision question in a second. Uh, Mazen, we um, you know ten years back, right? We all talk about prioritization, right? Hey, you know, we only have so many hours. We all live in a world of constrained resources. So let's prioritize those resources into bets which have the higher highest probability of success, right? Uh, I think in the life of an entrepreneur, especially in our you know initial years, there is no concept of prioritization, right? If, if you're chasing uh, three deals. And let's say one deal has a probability of 10% when one has 50%, one is 80%. You still put your best foot forward on all three. Uh, and and, and uh, there are so many examples, right, Shashank, where we have done that. And it, it ended up that, you know, we actually won the deal which has the, had the lowest probability, right? Um, because you have put in... You know, you you have you have the commitment from your wife, and remember this, guys. We were not, at least I was, not in my twenties when I started. You know, this company along with Sumit and Shashank. I was in my late thirties, almost in my forties, and we didn't have much room for error. Right, we had to make it work. <clears throat> okay, so now coming to your question about vision. Um, See, analytics, by the way, back then, uh, you guys may not even remember this, there was this concept called advanced analytics. You know, any times when, if you're just slicing and, you know, cutting and slicing data in a spreadsheet, then it used to be called analytics. And if you're building a model, uh, even a simple regression model, then it would be called advanced analytics. Yes. (laughs) Nowadays, it's called AI. (laughs) So there again. I was kidding. I was kidding. But nowadays, people call a simple regression AI. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then and then we came across this new terminology called data science, right? Uh, which also has many different meanings. But I think the most commonly used uh, definition is when you have some probabilistic uh, modeling happening on top of the data, mm-hmm. and then mass into what you you know what you just said is true, right? Now it's called AI, right? <laughs> Even a, a vanilla predictive model is called AI, right? Because more often than not, now it's done by the computer, right? It's not you, you know, you, you don't use a tool like SAS or, you know, MATLAB anymore. You use a computer, you call a function, and it becomes a machine learning algorithm, right? Uh, but going back to 2012, 2013, when we started this journey, a lot of this analytics uh, work. Uh, was being done manually, right? Answering business questions, uh, which requires required analyst was being done manually. 
And this way, there were a couple of challenges in that mechanism of delivering analytics. One was it was not scalable, right? Because remember, the volume of data was exploding, right? And this is around the same time when a lot of interesting technologies were coming into the picture, right? Cloud was starting to become a mainstream concept, uh, you know, uh, seven or 10 years back. And uh, Microsoft uh, Azure had just come into the market. AWS was around for a while before that. GCP was not existing back then. And, and then the integration of analytics and the insights that were coming off of those models, were, they were not integrated with the actual business process. Okay. Right? So we, uh, I remember Sumit Sashank and I, we had, when we had our first brainstorming meeting, uh, we discuss this. We really build this out, build this idea out as in how do you make analytics more sustainable and scalable? How do you integrate analytics with the actual business process so that the business out, the way you drive the business outcome is not a disjointed uh, journey, right? Mm -hmm. Offline spreadsheet. How do, you drive the, how do you drive the last mile adoption of analytics, right? Yes. And that became the mantra of the company, and it continues to be uh, the foundational mantra of, of Treatles. Shashank, you want to add anything to that? Also, you know, the fact that uh, the way technologies have evolved, right, there has been a, a, a very secular trend towards democratic, democratization, right? It started from the hardware, right? Like, you know, the first desktop computer, somebody asked, okay, why would you need a desktop computer at home? Now that's a stupid question, right? Uh, you know, from there it, it went on to, you know, things like internet, right? Computing power, all of that, right? I think you know, very soon uh, data science and AI, specifically AI, will start touching almost all the aspects of our life, right? Not just uh, as corporates, but also as individuals, right? The big problem that has been in our industry in data science AI is the problem of lack of simplification. Because a lot of companies have been created which make money out of deliberate complication, right? Uh, so they say, okay, you know what, math is complex, it is hard. I will tell you how to do it. You don't know how to do it, things like that, right? But if you want to democratize the technology, you need to know how to simplify that, right? And, and in that, you know, one of the biggest motivation and inspiration has been the design constructs behind Apple products, right? Now, of course, we're not a product company, but we want to use the same paradigms to ensure that we simplify AI, demystify it, so that we can democratize it, so that the warehouse manager with barely a, barely a graduate degree is able to use AI without having to go through a stats 101 or AI 101, right? I think that's where this industry is going to go and you want to really push uh, the momentum in that direction. No, that makes, that, that, that makes sense and that's quite helpful. Um, so, so can you kind of walk us through the next steps from there, right? You guys had this first brainstorming session. You knew this was a problem because you guys had worked on it before. Uh, how did you go from an idea uh, to, to actually getting your first customer and, and, and building out your first product? Yeah, see the, see the very first customer came uh, through a stroke of luck. Um, so this was a customer for uh, Sumit's customer from his earlier uh, you know, job. And, uh, and when that customer uh, realized that, oh, you know what, Sumit has left, started up on his own, you know, uh, they reached out to Sumit, right, to say, oh, you know what, you have started a company on your own, why don't you just do this one project for me? The funny thing was, that project had nothing to do with data science, AI, data engineering, it had actually nothing to do with, you know, anything that we do today, you know, it was a very, very different project. Uh, but, you know, we being entrepreneurs and opportunists, we actually took that project and thank God we did that because that created our first cash cushion, right? To start hiring people and start building some capabilities and strength and all that. Uh, we executed that, that project with the, with the, with a bunch of contractors. So we didn't hire anybody for that project. There's a bunch of contractors that we put in there, made some money out of that. So in a way that, that customer became our angel investor unknowingly, you know? So that is how we actually got our first customer. And, and they're on, uh, I think uh, this is 2013. Uh, there were three, I think, proof of concept, Shushang, that we were working on uh, you know, that fall. 
uh, and if I may go back to the my previous uh, you know uh, anecdote about the probability of winning, we probably less than ten percent in all three, uh, and we ended up winning two of those three, right? Um, yeah, which was uh, which was uh, a very phenomenal moment in our history, because I think if we had not won at least one of those three, we would not have existed as a company today. And in fact, one of those three still continues to be a major client for us. Sometimes it's just finding that right opportunity and jumping on it. But can you tell us a bit more about that? What was that project that you guys did? And, and then how did that evolve? You know, it's an, you, you said it has nothing to do with what you guys did to do today. So would love to hear a bit more about that evolution um, and, and, and what you learned from that first project and how it changed from there. I don't think we said that we don't do, uh, we didn't do back then what we do today. There, there are still a lot of similarities, Mazin. I think mm-hmm. Shashank was just quoting that first project uh, from that first client. The very first thing, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, if I may, if you allow me, I want to mention one quote, um, Mazin, which is, uh, you know, if you set your goals ridiculously high, and you fail, then you will still fail above everyone else's success, right? Uh, This is something we've always believed in. In fact, we encourage hiring leaders who have similar mindsets, right? It also goes back to what I was going to talk later, uh, that we like, you know, punching a few notches above our weight. Um, So, you know, in this one of these initial POCs, if I may, and I cannot name the customer, but I can share the context with you. We were, the, the job was to do a major transformation. Uh, it was to build a capability that would impact, uh, substantially change the way, uh, you know, uh, their business operated. And this was a Fortune 10 company and uh, imagine, right? We are a bunch of kids just starting out, embarking on such a major transformation journey. Now, and we were competing with several other bellwethers in the industry. Obviously, we did our bit. We tried to put our best foot forward. You know, we wore our best suits, whatever we had back then. You, but you wonder, right, why did the client place that bet on you, right? From our perspective, the incentive was very, very evident. It was a you know, do or die moment for us. But why did the customer choose to give us that project, right? Or not to one of our competitors who were much more settled and the risk of that competitor failing was probably relatively lower. Right? I think it's something about that hunger, right? Which is very essential in early stages of success. In fact, it still is, right? We still very much have that hunger today. The customer saw that, you know, these guys, they're going to do everything possible to make my employer successful, but more importantly, to make me successful. They will not let this project fail, right? They will pull whatever you know, resources they can pull from wherever the world, but they will make sure this happens because if it doesn't happen successfully, it's not just about me, uh, you know, this project not going well, but it's about them not being a solvent business, right? Six months down the line. So I think those are the moments where, you know, our customers place those bets on us, right? And a lot of these customers came through our own personal networks, right? So there was always a bit about that as well, right? where we were putting our personal capital, relationship capital on the line. And of course, I, we can talk about specific examples and content and so on, but those are the early moments, guys, which you know continued to expand. One became two, two became four, four became eight, and eight became 16, and so on and so forth. Yeah, Shashank, anything you want to add to that? Yeah? Let me see that we actually asked them, you know, after we won the, won the bid, once we won the project, we are actually surprised. We were sitting out of an apartment, this is a hundred billion dollar plus revenue company, Fortune 10. 10. We actually, of course, we didn't tell them we're in an apartment. We did ask them, okay, why did you choose us? You know, and, and that's what they said. 
that you know we believe that you will put everything you got to make us successful to make us win you know and that philosophy has continued till today if you if you ask you know what is our purpose statement right now this is uh, you know very well defined for us right our purpose statement is very simply defined as we empower decisions to help our clients win you know that that and client is actually the person first and the logo next not the other way around right and because we build those human relationships and because we inspire confidence that we will put everything possible to help our individual those human being customers win that just goes a long way and that learning happened from that deep that should be talking about that's that's incredible uh and so can you explain to our listeners how, how do you guys do this how how do you guys like what what's the pitch today for customers and and how how do you guys position yourself uh relative to some of your competitors see um today uh, the the biggest challenge is uh, the lack of uh, expected value realization from our ai investments that's the biggest problem you know everybody talks about ai everybody wants to do it everybody thinks somebody else has done it right but the reality is that the value, the 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 translation of all of that expectation into value realization is still challenged you know and the reason why that challenge exists is not because people are not doing good math is not because people are not deriving great insights the the reason why that challenge exists is because those insights are not being able to scale to the business and they're not being able to operationalize right so i can build the geekiest model possible to forecast my sales but if my demand planner if my warehouse manager is not able to use that solution then we haven't really moved the needle right and the incentives have been so aligned traditionally and that's where we came in that ai was a lot about consulting that okay you know what you give the insight do the nice presentation you get paid you're good right but the organization doesn't win just by having insights somebody has to do the last mile work of scaling those insights right into the enterprise ensuring change management happens which by the way is a big problem right and eventually operationalizing the insights right down to the store manager the warehouse manager the sales manager and things like that right that's where we come in right and 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 in order to, and for that to happen credence is not just a bunch of data scientists right we are actually a lot more than that right we have a we have a bunch of data engineers we have a bunch of, of solution architects process engineers change managers people who come from industry background people who come from functional background like supply chain customer analytics customer experience things like that right uh, and that is what makes us really really different because we don't just understand our customers word we actually understand the word of our customers customer you know and that is and that becomes a big differentiation that helps us operationalize uh, insights and scale it across the organization and and in addition to obviously value realization uh, our customers i um, mean right now the the theme that everybody is talking about is you know chat gpt and large language models and generative ai right so uh, our clients should reach it, it's overwhelming for them too right because if you are if you are uh, let's say an svp of a certain function in a fortune 500 company on one hand you have to meet your day to day goals and expectations right on the other hand you have to find uh, time and bandwidth and budget to really explore and unlock value from these new things that are happening around the world right so that's that's where in a company like treadens comes into the picture we will take these new you know ideas contextualize it to that organization to that function to that leader and 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 we'll figure out a way to unlock value from these new uh, you know new ideas and so i, I mean you, you you touched on chat gdp um though there's obviously been a lot of buzz around it uh, what are some of the big trends that you're seeing in the industry and 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 of course it's kind of spur, spurred a lot of big companies to think more and more about the role of ai and and how ai will kind of play a role in and how they serve customers so uh, can you walk us through some of those trends that you're seeing and maybe for for our sure. listeners funny potential entrepreneurs any interesting spaces that that they can get into maybe that was a mistake i should not have mentioned this word uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, so a couple of areas. I, I'll, 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 let me jump. Let me start, and then Shashank, please jump in. Yes, so, for us, since we are in the solutioning space, right? We we create AI solutions for our customers. We are approaching this in two ways. First is, you know, given uh, Chat GPT or large language models in general. Uh, you know, can help in improving productivity of our engineers, right? Our analysts, right? So we are exploring capabilities, how we do that, right? Can our engineers become more productive by leveraging certain toolkits? Uh, and how do we integrate those toolkits into the training programs, into their delivery platforms and so on, right? Because if we are able to do that, then we'll be able to create more with less, right? And we can pass on some of those benefits to our clients. And, and it also helps us internally, uh, uh, you know, becoming uh, a more profitable company. So that's number one. Second is, how do we help our clients become aware, identify use cases around, uh, you know, Gen AI and, and, and help them in driving their, a top line and bottom line better, right? Uh, by identifying capabilities, uh, defining blueprints on realizing those cap you know, those 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 blueprints over a period of time, uh, you know, and, and put the, all of that into an execution framework. So these are the two ways. Uh, you know, I can go into details of what those use cases are by function, uh, by vertical, uh, but at uh, broadly, these are the two ways we are kind of looking at this capability, kind of helping us as an organization and helping our clients, right? See, uh, you know, the foundational base layers, right? The large language models that are that have been put together by OpenAI and, and now Microsoft through their investment and partnership into OpenAI, now they're making it broadly available um, through... Uh, you know github and 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 other other you know sources as their copilot capabilities right uh, google is doing the same thing with bard so it's going to be it's we're not trying to create our own large language models right and maybe in some cases we are in niche cases but uh, largely speaking we are not trying to invent our own large language models because that's a very expensive thing to do right uh, unless you have billions of dollars sitting in your balance sheet it's 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 very difficult to do what we are trying to do is contextualize those large language models, right, uh, into uh, the functional areas such as supply chain, such as customer analytics, such as marketing operations, right, or vertical areas such as retail, such as healthcare, such as financial services, right. So we are taking those foundational, if I may say, generic conversational Gen AI capabilities and, and, and contextualizing them uh, to specific verticals and horizontals, right. And then of taking those contextual capabilities, which is level two, and further refining them into client-specific situations, right, which is level three, right? So take level one that exists in the base layers today and then develop level twos and level threes for client-centric situations. So that's what we are trying to do, uh, Mazin and Avila. So let me let me add to that also, right? See, for all the hype around uh, chat GPT, let me tell you two things that it cannot do, you know, uh, one in the short term, which is next five, 10 years, maybe they will solve it. And the one is the other is in a really long term, which is it will take maybe 20, 25 years or 30 years to solve that. Uh, see, in the short term, you know, there is this problem of reasoning. Yeah. Uh, now, today, what uh, and the two types of reasoning, the inferential reasoning is deductive reasoning, right? Inferential reasoning is something that, you know, we have been models have been doing for 30 years now. The large language model does that beautifully, right? And they do it so well, and that's why they are they're quite a craze. But there's something called deductive reasoning as well, right? And here's how it goes. Uh, if I get my five-year son, right, and you know, and he goes out and you know, he sees that, you know, where you know that dog and cats do not go well together, right? Because he had some experiences, he saw that, right? Uh, next time he is uh, uh, seeing a dog alone, if you ask him a question, right? Do you think you'll find a cat nearby? The guy will say without even thinking that the answer is no. You know, he doesn't need to. He doesn't need to know that those patterns. That is called deductive reasoning, right? And that deductive reasoning, right, is still not embedded in 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 the in in the GPT 
construct. Right? It will take some time to get there. Now that is now you know imagine this is a two variable problem: a cat and a dog. That's it, right? The kind of the kind of problems that we solve for some of the largest enterprise are hundred variable problems, right? But the deduction becomes absolutely complex, right? Because it's very in interconnected, right? That is one space. The longer space is the is the is is what we call a systems problem. Now, how does a systems problem look like, right? I'll give you a simple example of that. Uh, two years back, when the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, right? We all heard about it, right? Uh, you know, the and the a large part of supply chain got disrupted. Yeah, I was with one of my customers in Europe, right? And 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 the guy was perplexed, right? Because now what's happening is that a part of the supply chain is blocked, because of which the store shelves are becoming empty, because of which the 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 production fact the factories are producing a lot more, the warehouse is moving goods into wrong places, right? They are hiring a lot more expensive, you know, mechanisms to transport. People are the the pricing managers are are playing with the pricing, and the whole system has become incoherent, right? And a simple ask was: Is there a way that we can design a solution so that when disruptions like these happen, right? The organization and this is a hundred billion dollar organization, right? They're saying that can 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 hundred billion dollar organization right react as one common brain, as a single brain? Rather than disparate, rather than disparate movements, which are which are often at conflict with each other, right? But that is systems problem, right? But no single piece of algorithm can solve that problem. And 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 the more we we grow and more AI and data science matures, we see a lot of our problems are as solving those systems problems, right? So that these huge organizations can behave the way a human brain behaves, which is jointed, coherent, right, and at speed. And not you know incoherent and conflicted. Right? Chat GPT is like thirty years away from even defining that problem. Forget about solving it. Understand. Um, and I think over the last few years, you guys have raised uh, quite a lot of money. Um, could you talk about that in the context of your org as well as building these AI capabilities that you said? And you know you've been around for a decade almost now. Uh, so, what was the thought process behind raising now? Um, why did so much happen so quickly? Um, and you know, how has it helped or transformed or other such things with the AI capabilities, obviously in in the background? So, I think see, we have so far raised uh, two rounds, Series A and Series B, right? Uh, our Series A round, uh, you know, happened right in the middle of the COVID, right? Um, and and Series B just happened last December, right? Now you'll see some commonalities there, right? So both these raises happened, you know, at the time when the economy was challenged one way or the other, right? And and we as a company, right, have had always disproportionate investment into innovation, right? Uh, you know, and 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 when these uh, investors came, and by the way, both these fundings did not happen because we reached out. Both of these happened. Because the investors reached out, right? In, in Series B, there were multiple reach outs that happened actually, right? And and what drove our thesis to raise funding, right, was twofold. One was to have uh, you know ample cash to invest in innovation because our industry is changing very very fast, right? And if we are not ahead of the curve, then we are behind the curve, right? There's nothing in between here, right? The second thing also was that um, you know uh, we wanted to show, demonstrate some liquidity to our employees, right? And that is very very important for us. For us, wealth creation and wealth generation has to be demonstrated by cash and bank, and not just through a motivational speech, you know. Uh, and and we have done that uh, when we did a Series B, B we uh, returned about three and a half million dollars to our employees. Uh, in this series, in series A, sorry, in series B, we are returning about 26, 27 million dollars back to our employees, and that creates a significant um, realization of what we are trying to create here in the company, right? Now, uh, with series B, uh, our ambitions have of course increased. It's not just about in investing in innovation; it is also to drive in organic growth. Uh, it is also to seed in more capabilities, go into more industries, more geographies. Right, so all of those things are actually driving our growth agenda, 
but i want to reiterate this ability to to create value right for our employees is actually unparalleled most people don't don't see it that way but at you know at the size at which we are the fact that we have done two rounds of buybacks right is actually it has not happened in our industry earlier it has not happened period you know and we have done that so that goes a long way in 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 really uh, in realizing the promise and the value that we are creating here for everybody awesome and congratulations on that i will i will uh, let, let me let me give you a very nice uh, thing from the apartment right and you guys would would love that because this is probably the right point for that in take like 2 minutes so we had this guy right who joined us in the apartment and in the apartment we had this one moment when one of these big customers check the the payment invoice the check was delayed by a couple of weeks yeah so we were in a state where we are sitting on the last uh, day of the month the check has not come in and we had like 10 15 people in the apartment and we are get them on a call to tell them hey you know what we will not going to pay the salary on first of the month yeah and that was a tough time because i was in the apartment the 15 guys were there with me right and shubham smith were on the phone right i could only imagine how they were thinking because even if one of those guys had walked out from that call the company would be over you know because everybody else would walk out then so we had this uh, this, this call right it it lasted for a total of 5 minutes uh, one of the guys told okay is that all what you wanted to discuss that's fine like we can wait now if, if there's nothing else can you just let us go back to work you know uh, that guy is still in credence he's been like 9 years he's right here in dallas but there is another important thing that happened right now since we told everybody that okay you're not going to get your salary for next couple of weeks one of those guys came and sat next to me opened his laptop logged into his bank account and showed me see shashank i have only 100 bucks left in my bank account and i have this 5000 bucks of indian rupees 5000 rupees of credit card payment that is due you know uh, can you help me with that right i said yeah sure that's not a problem so i transferred money from my personal account to his account and that got done and mazin and avril when we had our series a round yeah this person sold a fraction of his stocks you know and uh, and he of course made some money and he sent me a screenshot of his bank balance and he showed me that this will never go to zero mm amazing that's really what we are creating amazing thank you for sharing that story that's awesome actually actually something uh, I, i remember shushank um, around the same incident when we were not able to give the salary on time it was delayed by a couple of weeks what we thought as a gesture of doing was you know pay them x percent more for that month right i don't remember the exact percentage i think it was 5 or 10% more now this another guy not the person that shashank is talking about another guy who is also with us he took offense to that that we were paying 10% more is like are you guys i know you by the three of you being founders are you taking more we said no uh, in fact we are taking less so he was like okay then i don't want 10% more i want the same thing that you guys do right and 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 that kind of passion right um um is is what got us through the last 10 years at the end of the day guys <clears throat> amazing thank you for sharing i think it's a good way to bring this to the close uh, with our final questions for both of you and why we call this podcast founders unfiltered what's one piece of unfiltered feedback you received in your journey as an entrepreneur that really changed your perspective i know you shared a few examples already but um something that was brutal something that was honest but you know you incorporated and helped you in your journey yeah uh should let go first Yeah. Mm-hmm. I uh, so first of all uh, we are a very open company so we have been getting through brutal feedbacks for last 10 years <laughs> often over a couple of beers or whiskies you know and it it's actually believe me it actually very very hurtful it's very brutal you know uh, uh i think see the i'll summarize you know, all of those brutal comments into one simple fact right that we have been told time and again and that we have learned now finally that see the kind of leadership that you need to run a company in the apartment is very different from the leadership that you that you need 
to run a 10,000 people company. You know, the apartment leadership is a tribal leadership, right? The 10,000 company leadership is a scale leadership. If a scale leader starts running an apartment, it will be a disaster. And if a tribal leader starts running a 10,000 people company, it will be an equal disaster, right? And just painfully and agonizingly realizing that difference, coming out of what you are, right? Destroying your past self and growing into becoming the scale leader. See, tribal leader has a charm of its own, by the way, you know? Now, you know people, you know, it's like a big, large family, right? You make emotional connects, we are in this together. It's like that, that, that commando team that is together, right? You, you live together, you die together, right? Scale leaders don't behave like that. The scale leaders are very, very different, right? You know, so I think just, just doing that, that, that transition, right? And on that, we have, I have personally got like huge amount of unfiltered feedback, right? Including uh, long lectures on empathy, uh, you know, on how you should not let your full force of emotion and passion get on one person. It just burns them out, you know, go slow, right? You know, all of those things. But I think this was a summary of the whole thing, right? It's, it grew from a tribal leader to a, to a scale leader. And it was it was very very difficult. Sure, I, I think what Shashank is saying, and I'll, I'll share some another example, another another uh, feedback, which personally has been very meaningful to me. But before I go there, what Shashank is trying to say is the journey of an organization, right, from zero to one, and then from one to ten, and then from ten to hundred, and from hundred to thousand requires very different kinds of leadership. Uh, obviously, in earlier phases, you need hustlers and all of that. And as you mature and become a larger organization, it requires more process, it requires more scale. And then, of course, you still want to maintain that sense of passion and sense of ownership despite the scale, right? Uh, and <clears throat> we ourselves as founders and other leaders that we have hired along the way We've had to adjust our leadership style based on which phase of this journey we are in. We have tried our best to hire leaders into the organization. We were do that who were most suited to that you know, phase of that journey. Sometimes we have succeeded. Sometimes we have made mistakes, right? Uh, but it's, it's not the same. It's it, the same doesn't work. The same leadership style doesn't work across these you know, phases of, of this journey. Um, okay, now coming to one feedback that I have received. And I, again, on this, I've gotten feedback that I got to change it. But I just struggle to change it, guys, to be honest, because I think it it works for me, right? Uh, which is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I always favor honesty, brutal honesty over hypocritical politeness uh, because I think it just slows down conversations, right? I've adapted to a style where I am I come across as more empathetic, right? While sharing, while, while dealing in situations like this. But having said that, I still don't want to compromise the truth uh, because eventually the truth always prevails, right? So uh, let's not try to be polite and nice for the sake of it uh, right. and, 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 and do something else behind the, behind the, behind the doors, right? So I will always prof prefer brutal honesty over hypocritical politeness, if I may say that again. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing so openly, Shashank and Shubh. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.